First of all, thank you for being here. And those of you who are interested, may I just remind you that you can join the philosophy sharing and become a member, um, which allows you to, um, to receive the magazine, to receive uh, updates, and also have discounts on the activities organized by the philosophy sharing. Um, Mid-May, we're going to have the publication of the next issue of the Share magazine. And this one is going to be about the academic work in philosophy, which is happening by, in Malta by Maltese academics and researchers in the field of philosophy. And I would also like to remind you all that we, the annual international lecture will be happening on the 1st of June. The title is The Good Life in Ancient and Current Philosophy, which will be given by Professor Katarina Delazari Radek. Uh, tickets are already available. You can go on our website and book them from, from there. Thank you very much. So today's talk is by Dr. Kurt Borch, who is a lecturer with the Department of Public Fo Policy at the University of Malta. His doctoral research is about the narration of the self. He has also published various work and papers, reviewed papers on subjects such as Butler, Foucault, disability, and other topics. His um, upcoming co-edited work is this book titled Schittfisser Lit Kumbnieden. And here we have another announcement. Uh, if you are interested, you can join for the book launch of this book on Friday, 19th May at 5 o'clock, ALT, University of Malta. Apart from that, this year, Dr. Borch will also be publishing a collection of personal philosophical essays, which will be written in Maltese. The topic for the day is to philosophize is to learn to die. And I leave the floor to Dr. Borch. Hi, everyone. Um, good evening. Um, thank you, Francois, for the introduction. And thank you all for being here. I'm um, actually really pleased um, um, to, to be giving this talk. I've been following the work of philosophy sharing since their inception, since I was an undergrad um, student myself um, a decade ago. So I'm glad to, to contribute in this small way. Um, I'd also like to thank philosophy sharing for their efforts um, to democratize knowledge and share philosophy not just with students and researchers of philosophy or in, within the, universe, the confines of the university, but within the community and the public at large. Having said that, um, the, well, the more philosophy that we have in this nation and the world, um, all the better. Having said that, I'm sometimes skeptical of the idea that everyone is a philosopher. You hear this, this, this phrase um, often. Um, since such an expression tends to disregard and sometimes downplay the scholarly side of what we do. Nonetheless, I think that preserving this public dimension of philosophy is more in line with an original conception of philosophy, not the original conception of philosophy, since I don't believe that there ever was one um, aim of philosophy, but surely philosophy always had a public um, dimension, which, which was to ask questions and try to figure out how to live, a very basic question. In fact, although the topic of my talk today is death, I also hope to shed some light on uh, the question of how to live has been raised and how this question has been raised by different philosophers across history. I also want to thank Philosophy Sharing for giving me the opportunity to sit down and gather some thoughts on questions related to life and death that have accompanied me um, and my reading in these last couple of years and not just as an academic um, interest. Although my talk will draw on a somewhat large variety um, of thinkers and at times will quote extensively, and I think that's breaking a cardinal rule when giving such um, talks, or even sometimes compare different editions of the same book, I hope that this doesn't come across as pedantry, but as an attempt to shed light on a philosophical point that's probably much more simple. One final note of preamble before I actually start my introduction. Um, although the tenor of the title of my talk, To Philosophize is to Learn to Die, notes on an ancient idea, carries with it a, a great deal of gravitas and perhaps seriousness or even promises at its end, some incredible insight 
that a grand philosopher might give, I regret to inform you that probably there won't be much of that. Um, it's not in a moralistic or grandiose spirit that I present um, these insights, but I want to recount and perhaps even relive with you the thought processes that carried me, as I sat down to gather my thoughts together on some, incidentally, of my favorite philosophers engaged with some of my favorite philosophical questions. Or if not favorite philosophers, then at least philosophers that it's fun or exciting and engaging to think with rather than think like. In fact, in fact um, uh, the, my talk today is in the spirit of what's called a philosophy as a way of life. Um, my understanding of philosophy is, is that it's not just about doctrinal or theoretical endeavors, but philosophy fundamentally is a practice. It consists of a series of practices, techniques, or what Michel Foucault would call techniques of the self, that can range from practices of meditating, practices of attention, practices of reading, even writing, memory, solitude, and even walking. These are all practices that we, most of us do on a day-to-day -day basis that I think carry with them a fundamental philosophical spirit. Philosophy, the way I view it at least, is an ethos to be embodied. It's an attitude and uh, that ideally should harmonize, um, it should harmonize between the logos, the word, and the bios, our life. In a quote by Seneca, let speech harmonize with our life. Philosophy, as I view it, is an art of living, something that we practice and train to become better at day by day. Ultimately, philosophy, as I view it, brings about transformation of the self in the words of Rilke. He said, you must change your life. The image there is actually Diogenes, the cynic, who provocatively went out in, his, um, in the village square with the lamp. He's often depicted with a lamp. He said, I'm out to find an honest man. Um, and I think this points to a certain provocative spirit um, of philosophy. I think there's a certain risk um, in, in the spirit of philosophy. As a method methodological um, influence throughout this talk, I will be greatly um, inspired by the work of Pierre Hadot, um, a historian of antiquity. He wrote this beautiful book called Philosophy as a, as a Way of Life. And also, I'm also inspired by the late work of Michel Foucault, particularly his lectures on antiquity, such as Discourse, on the hermeneutics of the subject, in which he discusses some of the practices um, of the self that animated um, ancient philosophy. But for the scope of today's lecture, I'll be, I'll be zooming in specifically on, the, on practices related to death and meditating upon death. In fact, for the next um, hour or so, I'll be exploring um, the relation between philosophy and death, particularly with regard to the expression to philosophizes to learn how to die an expression that comes to us at least from Socrates, but it's an expression that was animated and reanimated by different philosophers over time. So if you want, this talk will be um, like um, a chronological timeline presenting some key episodes, some, um, some key figures that have spoken about this idea. It's a genealogical um, activity, as Foucault would say, but which also carries with it a hint of problematization. So although I'll be presenting um, what these ancient and modern philosophers have spoken. I'll also, as I go along, will be problematizing them, showing where sometimes I disagree um, with how they raise the question of death. As a timeline, so this is like a table of contents of sorts, I'll be starting with how the question of philosophy, um, the definition of philosophy as a training for death, originates with Socrates. Um, then I'll move on to how Epicurus transformed the question in relation to overcoming the fear of death. Um, then I'll move on to how the Stoics transformed the question through what they call the premeditatio malorum, the premeditation of basically bad things happen to you, and how Epictetus and Seneca have spoken about this. I'll also say something on how the expression itself to philosophize is to learn how to die, how that was transformed from Cicero, the Roman statesman who popularized it, right down to Michel de Montaigne, the 16th century um, essayist um, who wrote an entire essay um, on it. I'll also take a brief um, detour through Christianity and see how some Christian um, philosophers, such as Saint Ignatius of Loyola, in his spiritual exercises, how he had, has transformed um, the meditation on death. While um, uh, preserving some of its ancient um, connotations. And then into the 20th century, the last checkpoint 
will be through Martin Heidegger and his kind of characterization of the human as being towards death. Then finally, um, having done this historical overview, I'll try to bring this to today's time. How can this expression that is almost 25 centuries old speak to us today? Right? As I said before, I'm interested in how philosophy is a practice and a way of life, not just a historical exercise, but I firmly believe that philosophy can do something to us, well, attempting to ask this question of how to live today. And I'll end um, by some reflections on contemporary social and political issues in light of what I am calling the politics of death. If you're interested in this um, topic, I greatly recommend these two books that have shaped my thinking as I prepared this lecture. The one on the left is Simon Critchley, um, his book of Dead Philosophers, um, and the one on the right, Dying for Ideas, a great book by Kostika Bratatan. Um, these are just two suggestions if you want to read further on this. Okay, let's start our um, historical kind of journey, if you wish. The story that I want to explore with you today um, starts with the death of Socrates. And... Uh, a remark that I think I, I read in Simon Critchley's work is that Western philosophy, as we know it, starts with Socrates, or rather starts with the death of Socrates. So if you wish, Western philosophy starts with the death of its father. And it starts, incidentally, with a political murder. Um, that is the murder of uh, the death of Socrates. One of the first things that anyone learns in a philosophy class is how Socrates died. So immediately the question of philosophy and dying are raised um, in, in tandem. And I want to start by unpacking this episode. This is a, a beautiful painting by Jacques-Louis David from 1787, depicting the final moments of Socrates. And we've got Socrates, just as he's, he's about to drink the hemlock, pointing upwards to wherever his soul is going. And interestingly, um, all his friends are basically losing it at that stage. And keep this dynamic in mind. So on the one hand, we've got the courage or the seeming courage in the face of death, um, demonstrated by Socrates in relation to all his friends grieving and mourning. This is a dynamic that will animate my talk throughout. All right, so how is this moment that, that we see depicted there narrated? And this narrated in one of Plato's dialogues, um, the Phaedo. Um, these are the collections. Sometimes you'll find them as the last days of Socrates. Um, uh, and I'll be reading um, the, the last two pages of, of the Phaedo, where we see the moment that we saw earlier in the painting. So thereupon, um, Crito nodded to the boy who was standing near. The boy went out and stayed a long time, then came back with the man who was to administer the poison, which he brought with him in a cup ready for use. When Socrates saw him, he said, Well, my good man, you know about these things. What must I do? Nothing, he replied, except drink the poison and walk about till your legs feel heavy. Then lie down and the poison will take effect of itself. With these words, Socrates raised the cup to his lips and very cheerfully and quietly drained it. Up to that time, most of us had been able to restrain our tears fairly well, but when we watched him drinking and saw that he had drunk the poison, we could do so no longer, but in spite of myself, my tears rolled down in floods, so that I wrapped my face in my cloak and wept for myself. For it was not for him that I wept, but for my own misfortune in being deprived of such a friend. Crito had got up and gone away even before I did, because he could not restrain his tears. But Apollodorus, who had been weeping all the time before, then wailed aloud in his grief and made us all break down, except Socrates himself. But he said, What conduct is this, you strange man? I sent the women away, chiefly for this very reason, that they might not behave in this absurd way. For I have heard that it is best to die in silence, keep quiet and be brave. Slight misogyny there. Then we were ashamed and controlled our tears. He walked about, and when he said his legs were heavy, lay down on his back, for such was the advice of the attendant. The man who had administered the poison laid his hands on him, and after a while examined his feet and legs, then pinched his foot hard and asked if he felt it. He said no. Then after that his thighs, and passing upwards in this way, he showed us that he was growing cold and rigid. And again he touched him and said that when it reached his heart, he would be gone. The chill had now reached the region about the groin, and uncovering his face, which had been covered, he said, and these were his last words, 
Crito, we owe a cock to Asclepius. Pay it and do not neglect it. Those are the famous last quote, moments of, of, of Socrates. I read, I read it at length because that, again, um, highlights the tension um, between the courage that the philosopher is expected to show in the face of death and, despite themselves, the grief and the tears um, of his friends. We find some other views by Socrates on dying in the Apology, the speech that he gave in his trial. And Socrates says the following, Those of us who think death is an evil must be mistaken, for the state of death is one of two things. Either it is virtually nothingness, it describes it as a dreamless sleep, or it is, as people say, a change and migration of the soul from this to another place. If it is the first option, unconsciousness, he says, it's like a sleep in which the sleeper does not even dream. Right? He says he describes it as the best um, kind of sleep, actually. So that's one option. The other option is that death is the, what, what's called the transmigration of the soul to another place. And Socrates says, if that's the case, then all the better, because there we would meet all the dead that were there, he says, including judges who are real judges, not like the ones who are in front of me. So in his final moments, this could be Plato embellishing this story, but this depicts the courageous truth-telling of the philosopher, that in his final moments, he's making a political um, statement and basically um, resisting the power, or not recognizing the power of the people who are um, sentencing him to death. And he ends his speech by saying, but now the time has come to go away. I go to die and you to live. But which of us goes to the better lot is known to none but God. So this is the attitude towards dying that we see um, in, in, in the Apology. In the Phaedo then, um, which is the, the excerpt I just read, it's where we find the first, at least the way I read it, the first definition by um, Plato that comes closest to the expression in the title of my talk, to philosophize is to learn how to die. In the Phaedo, Socrates says, a man who has really spent his life in philosophy is of good courage when he is to die. Other people are likely not to be aware that those who pursue philosophy aright study nothing but dying and being dead. So the proper object of study for the philosopher, according to Socrates, is actually death itself. Pierre Hadot takes it a step further and says that this melete tanatu, that's the Greek for meditating death. Melete is the Greek word for kind of meditation or an exercise for, um, of death. Hadot says that philosophy is not a, nothing other than an exercise of death because death is the separation of the soul and the body, a common characterization in ancient Greek dualistic philosophies. And the philosopher spends his time trying to detach his soul from his body. I found this to be particularly interesting because here we're not just talking about philosophy training you for the moment of dying, but that doing philosophy itself, since philosophy is con conceived as a cognitive exercise to train yourself from detaching from the body, to do philosophy is actually to be dead before you're actually dead, physically dead. So the philosopher, and I found this expression elsewhere, the philosopher is already half dead. Right? And that's meant, that's meant as a compliment, by the way, um, in, in, in the eyes of, of these. Just a brief word on the final words of, of Socrates, which is, Crito, we owe a cock to Asclepius. Asclepius is the god of curing. So when, if you've got an illness and you're cured of it, you will have to sacrifice a cock to Asclepius to thank him. And there's a discussion in the literature about what Socrates could have meant by those words. What was Socrates cured of? The, common, the standard interpretation, which is the one that Nietzsche follows and takes it against Socrates, Socrates as a result, is that Socrates is interpreted as implying that life itself is an illness. Right? So the standard interpretation is that Socrates wanted to give thanks for his soul finally being cured of being imprisoned in a body. To live is to be ill. Dying is therefore being restored to health. And Nietzsche doesn't like this. He thinks that Socrates basically lost it. He, he panicked in the last moments of his life. And Nietzsche reads this as a nihilistic statement, basically. And in his typical kind of mocking fashion, this is in, from the gay science, Nietzsche writes, this ridiculous and terrible last word means for those who have ears, oh, Crito, life is a disease. 
Foucault disagrees, um, and he cites some other classic, classic um, classicists, such as Dumézil, um, he, who was his friend and teacher. Contrary to this dominant interpretation, Foucault suggests that the cure for which a cock is owed to Asclepius is actually being freed from the common opinion, from the opinion capable of corrupting souls. So according to Foucault's interpretation, Socrates, in the final words, is not thanking the gods for releasing him from life, but from actually protecting him from false opinion. Let's leave Socrates um, behind. And how has this tradition of um, uh, two philosophizers to learn how to die, how was it taken up by other philosophers? And here I turn to Epicurus. Um, he lived um, a century after Socrates' death. The driving force of Epicurus' philosophy, the starting point, I would say, um, is philosophy as therapy. So Epicurus meant his philosophy to have therapeutic effects. Not least a psycho, or what today would call a psychotherapeutic effect. Basically, Epicurus noticed that the people around him are unhappy. And they are unhappy primarily because they are anxious. Right? They are, they are afraid. And the number one fear that people have, according to Epicurus, was fear of dying. So Epicurus said, before I can actually say something to make people pursue happiness, first I have to help them overcome their fear of death. And this is where Epicurus, who was, who was an atomist and a materialist, he turned to science, so to speak, um, with his notion of understanding of science, to help people overcome their fear of death. And this is a quote from the few um, sources that we still have of Epicurus from his letter. Epicurus says, Accustom yourself to think death a matter with which we are not at all concerned, since all good and evil is in sensation and what you feel. And he says, death is only the privation of sensation. Right? This is a very popular argument, where Epicurus basically says that um, once you're alive, you're clearly not dead, so it's kind of useless to worry about that. And once you're dead, you won't be around to basically be scared of it, so why, you, why are you worrying about it? So either, whether you're alive or whether you're dead, according to Epicurus, it's basically nonsensical to fear death. Right? Now, this is a very, again, as I said, a famous argument that not everyone um, is convinced by. In fact, when I teach Epicurus to my students, they immediately point to what's wrong with this argument, that basically what people are most scared about is not the state of being dead. If anything, they're scared, say, of the uncertainty of death, when it, they don't know when it will come, how it will come, um, the manner in which they, they, they will die. They do not know the impact that their death will have on others, and, what, and people are scared of actually losing others, for example. So although Epicurus' argument is meant to alleviate the fear of death, it might not be successful in capturing the complexity of people's fear of, of dying. But nonetheless, um, the fear of death finds itself in Epicurus' so-called tetrapharmakos, the four-part um, remedy, alongside his statements, do not fear the gods, do not fear death, what is, easy, what is good is easy to get, what is terrible is easy to endure. Right? This is the four, um, the tetrapharmakos. And as we can see, overcoming the fear of death is one fourth of that um, recipe. Moving even um, uh, further with the Stoics, um, and I will focus on a few quotations um, by Epictetus and later by, by Seneca. This is from Epictetus. Um, Epictetus knew suffering. He was a slave before he became a philosopher. And kind of legend has it that one of his owners um, inflicted pain upon him and even tortured him. So if you want, Epictetus' philosophy, not unlike other Stoics, starts with the awareness of, of suffering. If you're fond of a jug, Epictetus says, say, this is a jog that I'm fond of. And then, if it gets broken, you won't be upset. What's the message there? The message is that you should recognize what things truly are. In the case of a material object, such as a jog, if you recognize that that is a physical um, entity that's bound to um, break, when it actually breaks, you should not feel upset. A typical Stoic argument. He extends this analogy in relation to death and says, if you kiss your child or your wife, say to yourself that it is a human that you're kissing, and then if one of them should die, you won't be upset. 
Again, recognizing what things truly are. In this case, I know it sounds really brutal as a statement, as Epictetus' prose tends to be. But basically, the argument there is that if you recognize that we're dealing with humans, the essence of humans is that they are mortal, right? So you should prepare yourself to that reality. Keep death before your eyes every day. That's his message. Seneca, whose prose is slightly more um, colorful, um, uh, but nonetheless um, also presents his stoic writings in one of, I think, his most beautiful essays called On the Shortness of Life. Seneca writes the following. He says, You live as though you are going to live forever, at no time taking thought for your weakness, and you fail to note how much time has already passed by. You waste hours as though you were drawing from a well that was full to overflowing. Though all the while, that very last day you are giving to some person is possibly your last. So in Seneca, the meditation on death takes the form of making us aware of the precious, of the, the precious nature of the singular, singular moment. And the awareness of death, that should prompt you to transform your outlook on, on life. This is a kind of a YOLO philosophy, you know, you only live once, but not in the sense that therefore you should pursue unbridled pleasures, but to ensure that what you are living now is basically the best thing that you can do with your, with your life. This is the, the, the message of, of Seneca. He criticizes people who, and I, although this essay was written um, in the first century, I find this paragraph to, par to be particularly um, relevant Today, he says, you hear many men saying, of course, this is a highly gendered literature um, we're talking about, so it's always men. The assumption is that it's always men. Of course, this is something that we maybe can, we can take up um, later. But Seneca says, you will hear many men saying, after my 50th year, I will retire from work, and my 60th year will release me from official duties, right? And tell me, please, Seneca writes, what guarantee do you have that your life will be any longer? Who will allow this time to pass as you prescribe? Are you not ashamed to reserve for yourself just the remnants of life, if you, if you actually make it till, till then? How late it is to begin living only when one must stop. This is the kind of YOLO message I mentioned earlier. One must spend, this is the same essay, one must spend an, an, an entire lifetime in learning how to live, and which may surprise you more, an entire lifetime in learning how to die. So again, this is another instance in which we find this expression lifted essentially from, from uh, Socrates um, through Plato. Right, and when you do that, when, according to Seneca, once you train your consciousness in this art of dying, whenever the final day comes, the wise man will not hesitate to approach death with a steady step, right? For most of these ancient philosophers, to approach death with this unhesitating steady step is considered to be a virtue. Let's turn to see how Seneca himself actually died and approached um, death. This is again um, um, a beautiful painting, by this time by Peter Paul Rubens from 1612, depicting the death of Seneca. There are great parallels um, between Socrates' death and Seneca's. Um, uh, Seneca, too, was accused of um, some political stuff that he got in, in, involved in and was sentenced to death by suicide. And this, this is what the painting is, is showing. Tacitus, a historian from the time, wrote this short account of the death of Seneca, which goes something like this. He says, he writes, unperturbed. So again, there's this sense of... That, the true philosopher shouldn't be afraid to die. And in fact, if one is afraid of dying, that is um, a symptom that one is not a true philosopher. That's the assumption. So Tacitus writes, unperturbed, Seneca asked for his will. As he talked, he checked their tears and sought to revive their courage. Where had their philosophy gone, he asked. And that resolution against impending misfortunes, which they had devised over so many years. Then Seneca embraced his wife, and with a tenderness very different from his philosophical imperturbability, entreated her to moderate and set a term to her grief, and take just consolation in her bereavement from contemplating his well-spent life. 
what happened there, if anyone knows the story, basically Seneca's wife decided on the spot to commit suicide herself because she, she couldn't um, uh, endure. Um, uh, and this is what was going on. So Seneca was trying to kill himself, basically. It wasn't really going to plan. Um, uh, it was a mess. It was a mess, really. So it started out with kind of cutting his veins, which is what we see there. He was a relatively old man. His veins weren't good. Blood wasn't coming out. So they went through plan B, which was administering poison. He drank the poison, a la Socrates. The poison wasn't even working. And so he had to try plan C, which was going to this like, like a, not a sauna, uh, like um, a hot water bath, and he basically um, suffocated with the fumes. Terrible way of dying. Um, and while this was going on, his wife on the spot decides to kill herself, adding to his grief. Exhausted by severe pain, Seneca was afraid of weakening his wife's endurance by betraying his agony or of losing his own self-possession at the sight of her sufferings. So he asked her to go into another bedroom. Even in his last moments, his eloquence remained. This is another painting by Jacques-Louis David, the same guy who painted the death of Socrates, depicting the death of Seneca. So we see Seneca trying to die, his wife is being put, put away. Again, we, there are, I, say, I, mean, I said that there are certain parallels between the death of Seneca and Socrates, namely that both ask their wives to stop crying. Right? So there's the certain fear of vulnerability, weakness, and grief, a theme that I will return to um, in a bit. Next stage, Cicero. As I said, the simple Google definition will reveal that the expression to philosophize is to learn how to die is often attributed to Cicero, but as we have seen, it's really not Cicero who came up with it in, in 43 BC. It was, it was a, an expression already in the philosophical milieu. What's interesting, though, about Cicero is, is a note on grief. So this is a quote by Montaigne, who we'll discuss in, I don't know, maybe 15 minutes' time, when we get to the 16th century. Montaigne says, Cicero says that to philosophize is nothing else but to prepare for death. And I kind of wanted to trace the context in which Cicero wrote this. And it was actually revealing. The, the context was revealing. He wrote this in what's called the Tusculan Disputations. Um, uh, they're called like that because they were written in Cicero's villa in, in Tusculum. And these disputations are a series of books that he wrote towards the end of his life when he had retired from public life. Cicero was a very politically engaged man, but he wrote these reflections on on dying, on happiness, on grief, on virtue towards the end of his life. Interestingly, in that same year, his first child and only daughter, Tulia, had died following complications from childbirth. And I think that it's not incidental that um, uh, Cicero turned to ancient philosophy and ancient philosophical reflections on dying in the moment that he needed solace um, for grieving his, his, his daughter. So her loss, the loss of his daughter, afflicted Cicero to the extent that he abandoned all public business and retired to a country house. And in mourning, Cicero devoted himself to philosophical studies. And it is in that moment that Cicero made that expression um, famous, in the moment of his, his most vulnerable moment, where he himself is mourning. And, that's, and in this um, Tusculan Disputations, he is reflecting, meditating on the last moments of Socrates. And he says, on the last day of his life, Socrates held a long discourse on this subject, death, and when he had almost actually hold of the deadly cup, he spoke with the air of a man not forced to die, but ascending into heaven. For the whole life of a philosopher is, as the same philosopher says, a meditation on death. It goes on for a bit. He says, let us accustom ourselves to die. This is also an expression that you find, will find repeated more and more. Let us accustom ourselves to die. Get used to dying, basically. Okay, let's kind of recap the major points of what I was trying to do um, um, till now. Namely, some key points is that meditating on death is an integral part of the ancient conception of philosophy as a way of life. Awareness of death can illuminate one's approach to life, so it's not just learning to die for its own sake. The whole point of learning to die is to transform your life. 
The proper way to face death, according to these early philosophers, is courage and imperturbability. We saw it in the case of Seneca and Socrates. Fear of death is something that can and should be mastered, according to them. Dealing with death is something individualistic and pertains to the self, even if it concerns the death of other people. And to die is something to be learned, and that which one can become better. This is a sentiment, I'm, I'm jumping a bit forward, so it's like a mini break from the historical tour, to jump into an interesting comment made by Jacques Derrida, the 20th century philosopher, he died in 2004. Um, this is from a beautiful interview. Derrida is notorious for his difficult writing, but not in this interview. And this is considered to be the last interview that he gave, and it touched the subject on learning how to die. Derrida, in this um, interview, he was diagnosed with terminal cancer. He died a few weeks later, and he's reflecting on this, this notion. And the interviewer asks him, Derrida, uh, as a philosopher, have you learned how to live and therefore how to die? And Derrida, quite frankly, um, quite honestly, um, replies in the following way. He says, no, I, have, I never learned to live. In fact, not at all. Learning to live should mean learning to die. Learning to take into account so as to accept absolute mortality. That is, without salvation, resurrection or redemption. Neither for oneself nor for the other. That's been the old philosophical injunction since Plato. To philosophize is to learn to die. I believe in this truth without being able to resign myself to it, and less and less so. I remain uneducable, unable to be educated, when it comes to any kind of wisdom about knowing how to die. I still have not learned or picked up anything on this subject. The time of the reprieve is rapidly running out. Derda continues, we are all survivors who have been granted a temporary reprieve. So he is reinterpreting what it means um, to learn how to die. He says, we are all survivors, basically, who have been granted a temporary reprieve. And this is especially true in a world that is more inegalitarian than ever. He's writing in 2004. A world that is more inegalitarian than ever. For the millions of mil and millions of living beings, human or not, who are denied not only their basic human rights, which date back two centuries, but first of all, the right of a life worthy of being lived. This is a sentiment um, that I will return to at the end when, we talk, when I talk about the politics um, of death. Another note, this time from Cornel West. Maybe those of you are not familiar with Cornel West. He's a contemporary American philosopher who writes and speaks um, uh, in an incredibly, uh, he's, I think, the best example of popularizing philosophy. So if you want to read or check out um, his public lectures, most of them are on YouTube. I found this um, quotation from Cornel West to be, to hit the nail on its head, or at least the way I was approaching the question of philosophy and dying. And Cornel West, reflecting on a dialogue by Thomas More, asks this strange question. Why is it that Socrates never cries and Jesus never laughs? Did Socrates ever, this is West, did Socrates ever love human beings deeply as opposed to loving wisdom intensely? So Socrates is known as the lover of wisdom, that's the philosopher, the lover of wisdom. But West asks, has Socrates loved human beings as deeply? And then, kind of tongue-in-cheek, he says, of course, if Socrates was married, he probably had tears. He had kids, so he certainly shed tears. But Plato doesn't pick it up. The philosophers are not interested in this. They treat it as, a, as an aside. Plato doesn't pick it up. Xenophon doesn't pick it up. Aristophanes doesn't pick it up. There's no literary reference whatsoever to the tears of the philosopher. Even when Socrates is on his deathbed, as we saw, Xantippe, his wife, comes in crying. He pushes her out. I don't want to see her. I don't want to see the tears. Cornel West problematizes this, and I, I'm kind of quite in, agree, in agreement with, the, with this sentiment. And West says, if you're wrestling with what it means to be human, it's not going to be simply about the Socratic self-interrogation. It's also going to be about vulnerability. It's also going to be about tears. Tears, he says, will shatter your numbness. They won't keep you, you know, they will shatter this imperturbability that the philosophers prize. They will move you precisely, beyond yourself. 
something which the philosophers, as we saw, would be scared of. Tears will define in many ways what you fundamentally care about. And this is West, so at your mama's funeral, it's not a compliment if you stand there with a moment of self-mastery, rather than allow the tears to flow, because the love that you had for her is such that it overwhelms you. So here, here we see this problematization of the courage of the philosopher who wanted to control everything, including the final moments, and the vulnerability that, according to West, is what makes us truly human. And in relation to the other question, does Jesus laugh? I don't know, I'm not an expert um, in the Bible, but Jesus does cry, apparently three times, particularly uh, when his friend Lazarus dies. Right? There's this um, moment where, where the Bible says, and Jesus wept. Right? And it's interesting that Jesus weeps at the moment that he's mourning the death of his friend. Right? A sentiment that I'll return to when we'll talk about Montaigne, who had a similar experience. Okay. Moving on to the chapter on Christianity now. Let's get out of, kind of pagan antiquity into Christianity. How does Christianity transform this meditation on death that we've, we've seen through um, ancient philosophers? I'm sure many of you are familiar with this line from, from Ecclesiastes. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Right? Um, uh, it is better, the book continues, to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Right? So the prospect of death, the point of these statements, at least as I read them, is that the prospect of death emphasizes the emptiness of fleeting earthly pleasures, inviting us to focus on the prospect of an afterlife. So the, the, the prospect of an afterlife is something that, in my opinion, radically transforms the meditation of, of death. This sentiment, also, as, uh, that's why I chose that image, is in the spirit of the memento mori, right? So here, uh, you can't see it because it's small, but on this kind of parchment, is it a memento mori? Memento mori is, of course, remember that you will die, right? And you, you find this a lot in that um, genre of paintings no, known as the vanitas, um, um, that typically depicting a skull or the sand glass or the, the, the candle and so on. Things that will remind you of finitude and mortality. So, of course, there's a great tradition within Christianity that extends the ancient meditation on, on death. Right, I will do this through... Actually, I, I'll, I'll just mention um, one, one brief note. St. Augustine is an important figure in this regard. Um, uh, St. Augustine, who uh, the famous author of Confessions, um, a spiritual autobiography, and that book is punctuated by three deaths. So, Augustine prior to his conversion, um, loses his friend, and this was a significant um, episode in his life. Um, he loses his friend. Later in his life, his mother, St. Monica, dies, and, and then his son dies. So three very significant deaths in his life. But interestingly, it's the death of his friend when he was, um, before he was Christian that shatters him. And he describes it in this way. This is from Confessions. Augustine writes, I had felt that my soul and his soul were one soul in two bodies. So my life was to me a horror. This is how he describes his life once his friend died, as a horror. I do not wish to live with only one half of myself. And perhaps the reason why I feared death was that then the whole of my much-loved friend would have died. Right? So grief made Augustine no longer recognize himself. Right? And this kind of hints to the fundamental relationality upon which identity is built. Right? Something that Augustine was scared of. Augustine was scared of this grief. Later, interestingly, and there's a whole, I don't know, maybe theological debate about this, once his perspective was transformed after his conversion, he did not experience the death of his mother nor of his son in a similar way. Right? Right. I'm, I'm jumping a bit forward now um, in, into um, the early modern um, time, well, just before that, um, uh, to say something on Thomas Akempis. You might know of the book um, by Akempis, um, The Imitation of Christ, um, a very important, um, popular book, widely read. It's the most widely read Christian um, devotional work after the Bible. And it's a 15th century Christian um, uh, 
book of spiritual instructions that arose from the so-called Devotio Moderna movement. And in it, we find, um, the, the text is not important, and in it, in it we find, um, in chapter 23, is in fact a meditation um, on death. Where I'll just read uh, bits from it, just to give you a flavor of how the discourse and the uh, effect of this meditation changes from what we saw earlier um, with ancient texts. So the author writes, Very shortly, the end of your life will be imminent, so reflect on the state of your soul. We are here today and gone tomorrow. You should arrange every action and thought as if today were the day of your death. If you are unprepared to die today, will you be more ready tomorrow? Sadly, he writes, a long life tends to increase our sins rather than our virtues. I found this line to be slightly problematic and, and unsettling because whereas in the ancient context, as we saw in Seneca and even in Epicurus and others, every day was a precious moment in the lifelong attempt to become better. In, in Thomas Akempis, there's a, at least in this line, clearly shows it, a long life is basically a bad sign. Why? Because you're more prone to sin um, in, in that day. So I, 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 the way I read it is a, is a, a totally change in, in, in perspective. It's a similar approach that's taken up by Ignatius of Loyola and his famous spiritual exercises. Ignatius of Loyola was very much inspired by writers from the Devotio Moderna um, tradition. And his collection of spiritual exercises were collection, it's a, a collection of meditations and importantly visualizations intended to produce permanent psychic and mental effect, to form rather to inform. So the aim of these texts, and well, in fact, most of the texts I'm choosing to focus on, I'm not approaching them as intellectual treatises on, say, the nature of the soul. That's, that's all very interesting. But I'm choosing to read this expression, to philosophize, is to learn how to die, as it manifests in texts intended to bring about a change in one's outlook um, in life. These are books that are meant to work, so to speak, not just to form, sorry, not just to inform, but rather to form. And we will see, and I think it's a pretty strong um, formative exercise that we find in Ignatius. Interestingly, um, there's no one authoritative edition of the text um, by Ignatius of Loyola. And there are, you will find different editions as they were adjusted from the original, from the original um, version. And in fact, this led me to a kind of curious um, uh, thing related to T.S. Eliot, um, the poet, and how he came across Ignatius. And I came across this anecdote that T.S. Eliot was giving a set of lectures on the metaphysical poets at Trinity College, Cambridge, in 1926. And in his lectures, Eliot, at one point, severely criticized Ignatius and the prose of the spiritual exercises. He thought they, they were too melodramatic, too <laughs> sentimentalist. And in one lecture, at one point, he quoted what he thought was an excerpt of a meditation on death from St. Ignatius's spiritual exercises. And the excerpt was the following, and I'll just read it out. Contemplate, um, this meditation asks, um, contemplate your apartment faintly lighted by the last rays of day or the feeble light of a lamp, your bed which you will never leave except to be laid in your coffin, all the objects which surround you and seem to say, you leave us forever. The persons who will surround you, your servants, sad and silent. A weeping family bidding you a last adieu. The minister of religion praying near you and suggesting pious affect affections to you. Yourself stretched on a bed of pain, losing by degrees your senses and the free use of your faculties, struggling violently against death, which comes to tear your soul from the body and drag it before the tribunal of God. At your side, the devils, who redouble their efforts to destroy you. Your good angel, who assists you for the last time with his holy inspirations. Great stuff, huh? This is the line that T.S. Eliot quotes, and he describes it in this way. He says, is this, is this not a spiritual hashish, a dragging of the emotions, rather than an intellectual preparation for spiritual contemplation? So this is the problem that Eliot had 
As it happens, in the crowd was an American Jesuit. And of course, Jesuits, you would know, you'd expect that they would know Ignatius' text. This, this Jesuit and Francis Joseph Yeely basically called him out, not on the spot. He wrote him a letter and told him, listen, T.S. Eliot, the stuff that you're quoting is not Ignatius. It's one of the later um, uh, additions to, to his work. You will not find a meditation on, of, on death in, uh, in, uh, in, in Ignatius. What you will find is, is this. So these are some of the um, uh, later editions. This is the Manresa edition that Eliot was quoting from. But this is, this is an, a 19th century um, version of, of the work. But of course, Ignatius' text was from before. Um, this is from the 1840s or 1860s. Um, uh, I'm not a historian, clearly, um, so I, I didn't want to waste too much time to forget the exact dates. But this is the longer, much longer um, version that Eliot was quoting from. And he was quoting from this, the second exercise on death. Right? So there's a first exercise, second exercise, third exercise on death. These are all editions of, of whoever wrote this. Um, what you find, though, just before it, is a first exercise on hell. And this is the, the stuff you'll actually find in Ignatius. And I'll just read um, from this. So this is the meditation on hell that you find in, in, uh, in, in, in St. Ignatius. It asks us to represent in our imagination the place, in this case, hell. Here it will be to see in imagination the length, breadth, and depth of hell. And it asks whoever is doing the exercises to beg for a deep sense of the pain which the lost suffer. Right? This is meant to induce in one's psyche a kind of fear of what will happen to you if you do not love the eternal God, the author says. And, it, and this text, that's why it's a meditative text, it works on the senses, not just on the intellect. You will see St. Ignatius invokes all the different senses. So he asks us, this will be to see in imagination the vast fires and the souls enclosed, as it were, in bodies of fire. To hear the wailing, the howling cries and blasphemies against Christ our God. With the sense of smell, to perceive the smoke, the sulfur, the filth and corruption. To taste the bitterness of tears, sadness and remorse of conscience. With the sense of touch, to feel the flames which envelop and burn the souls. The meditation goes on. But the interesting thing is that once this meditation on hell ends, you'll find this note by Ignatius and says, that say, which says, if the one giving the exercises judges that it would be profitable to the exercitant who is ever doing it, other, punish, other exercises may be added here. For example, a meditation on death. So what you find in St. Ignatius is like, if this meditation on hell isn't enough, you might want to consider a meditation on death. And this is exactly what the Manresa version does, right? In these three different exercises on hell, on, on hell and eventually on death. And I'll just take you through a few, if that's okay. So the first exercise on death, um, as you can see, the language is very different to what we were seeing earlier in ancient, in ancient times. So the Manresa author writes, transport yourself in thought to the bedside of a dying man beside a grave open to receive a coffin or to the middle of a churchyard. Ask of our God a salutary fear of death. And the, and the first exercise asks the reader to meditate on the following. What is death? Must I die? Shall I die soon? When shall I die? How often shall I die? That's the first exercise. The second exercise then moves to the contemplation of the, um, through the senses. So you've got the application of the sight and that's when we get the lines that T.S. Eliot was quoting from. It says, contemplate your apartment faintly lighted. That paragraph was the application of the sight, right, from the Manresa edition. But this is, again, the application of the hearing, of the taste, and of touch. I'll just give you a flavor of that. This is the second meditation. It are, sorry, the third, the third, the final one. This is a contemplation of your state this time. Well, I skipped this line. Okay, let's, let's go with this. So this is the third exercise on death. This is contemplating your state after death, right? So it's not a meditation on death and the process of dying, but it's time after death. So this is, I think, 
a radicalization of the ancient meditation on death. It goes something like this. Application of the sight again. Consider a few moments after your death. Your body laid on a funeral bed, wrapped in a shroud, a veil thrown over your face. Beside you the crucifix, the holy water, friends, relatives, a priest kneeling by your sad remains and reciting the holy players. The public officer who writes in the register of the dead all the particulars of your disease. Consider the day after your death, your inanimate body enclosed in a coffin, covered with a pole, taken from your apartment, sadly carried to the foot of the altar, deposited before the Lord, and so on. Then consider some months after your death. Contemplate this stone already blackened by time, this inscription beginning to be effaced, and under that stone in that coffin, which is crumbling bit by bit, contemplate the sad state of your body. See how the worms devour the remains of putrid flesh, how all the limbs are separating, how the bones are eaten away by the corruption of the tomb. Application of the hearing, that was just of the sight. Application of the hearing. Go through again the different scenes which you are the spectacle. Listen to the dismal sounds of the bell announcing your death, the prayers which they recite at the foot of your bed, the remarks of the servants who speak to you, of you, not to you, of you, your friends and relatives who communicate to each other their reflections on your death, the chants of the church during the funeral service, the conversations of the persons whose duty is to call to your wedding. Application of the smell and of touch. Imagine yourself respiring the odor your body exhales when the soul is departed. The infection it would give out if it were taken from the coffin a few months after your death. Imagine you touch this damp earth where, you have, where they have laid you. The shroud, this bare skull, once the seat of your thought. These dismembered limbs which once obeyed the order of your will. And it closes, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And the colloquy with our saviour dying, into thy hands I commend my spirit. So I think this is the most radical meditation of death I, I found them, to be honest. As you can see, the prose is incredible, it's intense, it's very visceral, and it works not just at an intellectual level, but on all dimensions of, of the senses. And I, in my opinion, this is... It's, it's, clearly, there are echoes of the ancient meditation of death. Saint Ignatius, Pierre Hadot says, basically lifted a bunch of the practices of the self that he found in antiquity, but gave them a very different um, garment in, um, in the Christian metaphysics, of course. All right, I'm moving towards the, the end. Um, I know this was slightly heavy, but Michel de Montaigne, a very different sort of character. Um, also a religious, um, a religious man, but his faith was of a different flavor and kind than surely St. Ignatius. And they were lived around the same time, 16th century. But Montaigne is a very, has a def very different temperament with regard to death. He's a, for those of you who are, don't know Montaigne that much, he's a significant philosophical writer of the French Renaissance. He popularized the essay as a literary genre. He wrote a massive volume or a size contains some of the most influential essays ever written. His work, magisterially, I would say, merges anecdote with autobiography, personal rumination, and even intellectual insight. And he was an avid reader of um, the classics. That's the complete essays of Montaigne. And he was also a politician, right? Um, uh, if you're interested in Montaigne, I greatly recommend this book by Sarah Bakewell called How to Live. Right, what, where does Montaigne feature in this story and the history of um, philosophy and death? Let's just go through a brief timeline um, uh, related to Montaigne's life. He was born in 1533. In 1563, when he was just 30 years old, a significant moment in his life happened, which is the death of his best friend, Etienne Laboisy, um, uh, of illness. And Montaigne was at his bedside. In my opinion, this episode the grief that Montaigne felt, not unlike Augustine, a thousand years before that, shattered his sense of self and transformed his life entirely. A few years later, Montaigne's father dies. A year later, his brother, younger brother Arnaud, dies in a bizarre tennis accident. That same year, Montaigne himself almost dies. This is an important moment as well in his life. 
uh, he had a near death experience. He was basically run over um, uh, while he was out um, on his horse. Uh, he was run over by another chariot and he almost died. In 1970, Montan retires from public life and retreats to his family estate to just basically meditate, read, and write his essays. That same year, his first baby is born and dies two months after. Montaigne went on to lose four more of his children. That, um, two years later, he begins his work on the essays, and one of the very first essays that he writes is the, the essay titled Two Philosophizes to Learn How to Die. A few years later, he starts suffering um, kidney stone attacks. 1580 he publishes the first edition of his essays, um, which he edits over and over in different editions um, for the rest of his life, and he dies in 1592. Well, I said that um, Montaigne was an avid reader of the classics. So he read, a great admirer of Cicero, of Seneca, and a bunch of the guys um, that we've encountered throughout this lecture. However, rather than not being afraid of death, the more he read about death, the more afraid he, become, he, he became. Right? So he says Montaigne, in his 20s, he suffered from morbid obsession with death after reading classical philosophers. And as he reached his 30s, as we saw through that timeline, death w was basically um, uh, coming closer and closer and much more personal through the death of um, those close to him and almost the death of himself. But rather than solace in philosophy, he found more anxiety, right? And Montaigne is quite um, honest about this until he had his um, incident, right? And he says that that incident transformed his life um, entirely, right? This is from an essay of his called On Practice, right? He says, we should practice. You know how we've been seeing that Socrates says, you should practice dying, Right, so that you become better at it, practice dying. But Montaigne says, unlike other things, such as, say, archery or whatever, I only have, like, one chance at dying, so it's not an activity that I can really become better at. Although I can meditate and read a bunch of books about dying, I only actually die once, so what are these philosophers kind of on about? He's, he's critiquing the efficacy of philosophical therapy, if you wish. And he says, and Montaigne is upfront about this and says, well, this didn't work for me. What actually worked for me was the experience of almost um, dying. And he recounts it in, in great detail. He recounts how he lost consciousness. I think it was the first time that he actually lost consciousness. How he was like vomiting blood, how the pain that he felt, um, the delirium that he experienced. He goes phenomenologically even um, through these sensations and he says, that is actually what made me overcome um, the fear of death. So the advice that Montaigne gives, he says, he writes, let us deprive death of its strangeness. Let us frequent it. Let us get used to it. Let us have nothing more often in mind than death. Including in the midst of joy and feasting, let, us, let our refrain be one which recalls our human condition. This is what the Egyptians did, he writes, in the midst of all their banquets and good cheer, they would bring in a mummified corpse to serve as a warning to the guests. Right? In, a, in a literal representation of the memento mori, remember that you will die. And you do this, not when you're depressed and anxious, in the midst of life, right? in the good cheer. In the, in the moments when one is bound to be in denial, basically, that one is going to die. And following this advice, Montaigne writes, similarly, I have adopted the practice of always having death, not only in my mind, but on my lips. I like that line because, once again, it problematizes the idea that philosophy should just work on one's intellect. Right? Philosophy is not just a cognitive experience, it shouldn't be, um, but on one's lips, right? touching one's lips. All right, to start concluding, into the 20th century, I promised to say something on Heidegger because, for better or for worse, when one discusses the relation between philosophy and death, um, uh, well, one must say something about um, Heidegger. Particularly his characterization of the human, as he calls it, beings towards, being towards death. That is his um, characterization of what it means to be human. This is how Simon Critchley, probably the topmost Heidegger scholar, um, describes it. What it means for a human being to be is to exist temporarily in the stretch between birth and death, right? So this is a famous 
definition of Heidegger that he says we are thrown not just because we are situated in a time and place, but we, it's as if we are thrown. We're like a projected arrow always geared towards death and always approaching death. And that prospect structures our life, according to Heidegger. It individualizes us, right? So Heidegger says death makes us an individual. He links the prospect of that with authenticity, right? So he says that is what makes you who you really are, right? And that is, importantly, what gives meaning to our, to our, to our life. Now, this is, and then the problem with Heidegger, according to, to Critchley, is that Heidegger argues that the only authentic death is one's own, right? So the most important thing about Heidegger is your own death. That's the only death that you can have a relationship with. Right? This is Heidegger's phenomenology. The deaths of others are secondary to my death. I cannot die someone else's death. Even if I choose to sacrifice myself for them, he famously says, it's still my death and not the death of the other. Many commentators, including Simon Critchley, but before him Edith Stein and Emmanuel Levinas, basically contest Heidegger's view. And this is the spirit that I want to um, start concluding with. Critchley says that, on the contrary, I think that death comes into our world through the death of others, whether as close as a parent, partner or child, or as far as the unknown victim of a distant famine or war. Right? And interestingly, Critchley himself wrote the book on death that I recommended in the beginning, in the aftermath of the death of his own father. It was his way, maybe, of dealing with, with grief. And it's not an uncommon experience. We saw Montaigne do it when his friend died, he turned to essay writing and, 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 and others. We saw Cicero doing it when his daughter died. So I'd like to push this a bit further. Right? I'd like to introduce or place grief, um, that is, the mourning that one feels in, in the face of the death of the other, as structuring one's life. It's not as such courageously facing one's death which is the most philosophically interesting um, experience. And Krishli goes on, the relationship to death is not first and foremost my own fear for my own demise, but my sense of being undone by the experience of grief and mourning. It's something over which I have no mastery. The other dies, I am bereaved. I cannot will the other's death away. That mourning, as it were, structures me. Right? So here we see a very different perspective and a kind of problematization of um, the relationship between philosophy and death that I have been exploring. Right? So we started now in the beginning with Seneca and, and, and Socrates and those figures um, keeping grief away. And Seneca even famously placed a time limit on the grief of his wife. Right? But this is a different point of view now. And one final point on, on Heidegger um, that Critchley contests is his anthropocentrism. Right? Heidegger at one point says that only human beings die, whereas plants and animals simply perish. Right? And uh, Critchley writes that even empirical research would certainly seem to show that the higher animals, dolphins, elephants, but also cats and dogs, also have an experience of mortality, of both their own and those around them. So we are not the only creatures in the universe who are touched by the sentiment um, of death. All right. To conclude, um, I promised to bring this, so this was the table of contents I showed earlier, I promised to bring this to today, right, in relation to what I, I, not I, but I follow others in calling the politics of, of death, right, so on the, I'm going to have like five, seven minutes um, left and then I'll, I'll wrap up for good. I'll be, I'll be saying something, some, drawing some conclusions on how I think some of the insights that I've been exploring can speak to us um, today. And to do that, I once again want to turn to Cornel West, right? Um, this, is a, this is a great line from, from Cornel West that I'll take as a springboard to my own thinking. And West says, we, we are beings towards death. We already saw that through Heidegger. We're featherless, two-legged, linguistically conscious creatures born between urine and feces whose bodies will one day be the culinary delight of terrestrial worms. That's us. 
we're beings towards death. To be human means to wrestle with death. That's a fundamental existential condition. But I want to draw a political insight um, with West um, on this, that for some people, this wrestling with death takes different forms. Death is not just an abstract category or an ontological situation that everyone experiences in the same way, but rather it's a lived reality. It's a lived experience of early physical death for some, or the prospect of physical death, of social death, of psychic death too, of some people feeling that their death is more likely than others is, of tasting blood as the aggressor's blow lands on their mouth, of gasping for air as the authority's knee presses on their neck, of the sense of fear of, and trembling as one is made to feel like the world is not their home and that they are not welcome here. And this is how I think the Socratic legacy brings together the ethical with the political. Right? Keeping alive the Socratic legacy, West maintains that at this point philosophy becomes or must become a critical disposition of trying to keep alive a, a very fragile democratic experiment in the face of structures of domination. Right? And this very much reminds me, and I have to introduce um, uh, Butler as, in this conclusion, and not least the first non-male philosopher to feature in this lecture. As I said, there's something very male-centric in this genealogy of philosophy and dying, and I don't think that's an incidental um, point. Butler, um, who's a contemporary um, American philosopher, um, uh, introduces this notion of grievability, right? That, and argues that some lives are grievable and others are not. What does this mean? So Butler argues that a sign that a life matters is that it is grievable, it is grieved. Its loss is recognized publicly or personally by the community or by one significant others as a loss. Such lives are supported and allowed to flourish. They are mourned, mourned when, when, when uh, they die. And their death is registered as a loss individually or collectively. While some lives matter, for Butler, other lives are more exposed to death. And their death is registered less or left unregistered. What it means to live one's life as ungrievable is to live with a somatic sense of dispensability and a lived conviction that the world is such that some lives do not matter and will not be safeguarded. It is as if one is already dead before one even dies, in a very different sense than Socrates said in the beginning. So although grief may be associated with death, specifically the grief experienced by those who survived the loss of another, Butler insists that grievability is actually a trait applicable to the living. To say of a living person that they are grievable is to say that they would be grieved were they to be lost. It is also to say that the world is or should be organized to sustain that life. This is the political moment, this is the politics of death. How to create or to work towards a society in which grievability is more equally distributed, as Butler would say. And this is the power of grief, right? Butler has written extensively, not just in that latest book on the pandemic called What World Is This? A Pandemic Phenomenology, but in other works such as Precarious Life. And Butler says that mourning, the activity of recognizing that a life has been lost and publicly and collectively recognizing lives is a significant moment and carries with it a certain power. Mourning can create a collectivity, it can give sustenance to a community, but it can also be a form of resistance to recognize that a life has been lost and not simply to ignore that fact. It can also be an attempt to create an inhabitable world. This is how Butler describes the, the power of grief that the philosophers had long wanted to, to, to silence. Butler writes, a purely private form of mourning is possible, but can it release the open cry, the stories, the songs that petition the world to bear witness to this loss in its singularity within a social fabric of interwoven lives. And so for Butler, the experience of grief carries with it this, this great significant power. Right? The value of that person is now carried in the lives of others, a form of acknowledgement that becomes a living echo, an animated wound or trace that transforms those who live on. So grief and mourning transforms us. 
as if the musicality of mourning, this is an expression, interesting expression, the musicality of mourning makes its way past borders by virtue of, of its acoustic powers. So mourning, the experience of grief, opens us up, basically. It has a certain rhythm, it has a certain echo. Butler calls this to be undone or to become undone. Right? And this grief challenges the presumptions of control and mastery that you know, ancient philosophers thought they had over life, basically. Grief challenges our sense of self and who we are. Right? Butler writes, who am I without you? When we lose some of those ties by which we are constituted, we do not know who we are or what to do. On one level, I think I have lost you, only to discover that I have gone missing as well. And that's exactly what St. Augustine felt when his friend died. That's exactly what Montaigne felt, right? And rather than trying to repress that feeling, Butler is saying, own up to it. That is actually what makes us human. Let's face it, we're undone by each other, and if we're not, we're missing something, right? There's a famous line from Precarious Life. Two final slides. Two other applications related to the politics of death. One in relation to what I'm calling the politics of work and time. Right? I'll, I'll um, just read through this. So awareness of mortality, right? meditating on one's death, which is what I've been doing for these last over an hour, um, can prompt us to rethink how social life is organized, particularly with regard to the structure of most people's employments, for example, and the security, dignity, free time and remuneration that most jobs give you, give us, or do not give us. Most jobs deprive humans of agency, alienate them from themselves and others, breeds cynicism and helplessness. Thus, there is an important link, at least I see a link, between philosophy as learning how to die and philosophy as a critical disposition calling out structures that are preventing humans from freely structuring their life and the finite and thus incredibly precious time that they have. This is an argument that I see so elaborated in this wonderful book called This Life by Martin Haugland. And lastly, um, the politics of death much more broadly construed on a planetary um, level. I think that in this era we're living in, we must think of the expression to philosophize is to learn how to die in the context of the climate crisis, which is resulting in excessive deaths, not just of humans, but, uh, but other forms of biodiversity um, uh, and, uh, and, and beyond. Right? So many studies project that climate change can cause a significant number of excess deaths. Habitat conversion brought about by climate change effects is resulting in terrestrial biodiversity loss. Climate change affects the social and environmental determinants of health, such as clean air, safe water, sufficient food, and secure shelter. And between 2030 and 2050, climate change is expected to cause approximately 250,000, quarter of a million, additional deaths per year. Right? And I feel that such reflections should prompt us to critically think about how anthropocentric models of thinking and economic activity concerned with profit maximization only is quite literally resulting in the destruction of everything. We need to think more of philosophy as learning to die in order to challenge the fantasies of mastery and control that humans have and which are not only unsustainable but perverse and destructive. Thank you very much for your time.